Hi everyone, it's the Catholic CEO Henry Katarna. Welcome to this Catholic Business Wisdom series. Today our topic is currency. So a little bit of a continuation on our money and banking topic. But currency is a more narrowly defined topic and so I wanted to cover a few things with you today. I actually have 13 or specific points to make in quick fashion here. So here's the first point. We have what is called a fiat currency. You'll remember that that's uh, money in a sense created out of thin air. It's a lot more complicated than that but I spoke about that last time. So we have a, a fiat currency and the meaning of that is that the, the Latin expression fiat meaning let it be or so, so it shall be as the Blessed Virgin Mary said in her fiat to the angel Gabriel. It's a currency that we believe in. The reason that the dollar is worth a dollar and that we denominate ourselves and all of our work in dollars is because we believe in it. If the government says that a dollar is worth a dollar and we're going to pay you in a dollar and you're going to borrow a dollar, well, we believe it. And that's the reason that it all works because we all have a common belief in the dollar. If it were even humanly possible for suddenly everybody to stop believing in the dollar, well, it would cease to exist. We would then move to a different currency. Think of an example in many prison camp stories. What did they use as currency? Well, pieces of chocolate, cigarettes, a little bit of liquor if they had those little bottles, and a number of other products became the medium of exchange. And they denominated everything in terms of how many cigarettes it was worth, for example, or how many pieces of chocolate something was worth. So. It's a fiat currency. Second point, it's not gold-backed. There was a time when the currency was backed by gold, and so a dollar was backed by a dollar's worth of gold somewhere in one of the vaults, like in uh, Fort Knox. So it's not gold-backed, but you could argue that it's petro-backed. The US dollar in particular is the world's reserve currency. That means it's the favored currency in all the world, and most debt in the world is denominated, at least global debt, international debt, and even large corporate debt. It's denominated in the U.S. dollar. And so you could say that it's backed by the petrodollar because the U.S. with its massive reserves of oil and gas has specified that the dollar is to be used for most transactions in the world. And so it's not gold-backed, but you could argue that it's backed in terms of the petrodollar. And right now there's a movement afoot, as you know, for other countries, the BRICS countries, for example, to start uh, denominating another, a new type of currency backed by gold. So pay attention to that. For your business right now, it probably doesn't matter as much. But the good news for a Canadian and U.S. and even a European business is that the currency that you use, particularly the U.S. dollar, is really the world's reserve currency and it's backed by the strength and the reserves and the wealth of the nation as opposed to an ounce of gold. Next point. Number three, it's a regulated currency. You cannot issue your own currency. You have to only issue and use Canadian or US dollars or euros to do your transactions. You cannot invent something that says, I'm inventing the Henry. The Henry is worth two US dollars. I could try to do that it wouldn't necessarily be illegal, but it would be impractical because nobody's going to believe in the Henry because I'm nobody knows me. I'm unknown. So think of it that it's a regulated currency and therefore there's some rules about it. So you can't counterfeit. You can't create fake money. So we live in a, a regulated currency environment. Fourth point, there's legal tender. The concept of legal tender is the currency that we actually have, dollar bills that we exchange. Remember, we don't have to carry sacks of gold around <laughs> or our products with us. I mean, if, we make, if we're a carpenter, we don't have to carry a piece of furniture around to show that we want to trade that for groceries. We can use cash. And cash is made up of dollar bills and coinage. And there's all kinds of different denominations. And you've all heard of in Canada, for example, there's no more pennies. I noticed that in the U.S. there are still pennies, but that's soon to be gone as well. And there's even talk in Canada of 
I think it's wild talk, but there'll be no more nickel, and so you won't be able to rub two nickels together, as they used to say in earlier times. So the fifth point is there are other kinds of money that are not exactly currency, but they are as good as money. And so a certificate of deposit in the United States, you'll have an IRA or a CD, a certificate of deposit. In Canada, you'll have a GIC or an RSP. These are accounts and they're not like bank accounts. These are money, but they're not currency. So it's important to distinguish. You see where I'm going with this. Think about currency as being different from money. There's lots of ways to denominate money and to show it. Your bank account, the money supply, coins, cash, bills, certificates of deposit. These are all money, but not all of them are currency. So just as a technical point, be careful that you know what you're talking about there. Uh, the sixth point is yet another example. A letter of credit. Sometimes if you are going to a different country and you're doing international business, let's say you're exporting to a, another country and and they will demand a letter of credit from your bank, let's say, indicating that you actually have money on deposit in the bank equivalent to the money that you're going to you know, want to transfer to that other country to get some production going or to buy products or to even to build a factory in their territory. So a letter of credit is as good as money. It's not currency, but it's as good as money. And it is money because it represents the bank's promise that you actually have that money. Or if you're a large um, global corporation, you can sometimes issue your own letter of credit and the other party will believe it because they know that you're not going to scam them on that account. I mean, there's a hundred ways to scam people, but usually a letter of credit that says, here's that we're worth a hundred million dollars and we're gonna spend a hundred million in your country. That's not easily scammable. You can also remember that there are different forms of it. So there can be literally a letter, but there can also be a wire transfer. So money can be sent. It's not currency, remember, it's money, but it can be sent by wire transfer. There's this SWIFT system, which is a US backed system of currency flows back and forth between countries. And SWIFT is an agreement where you have protocols for how money is to be transferred, how much delay there is, and how much can be transferred by anybody using specific protocols so that there's no scamming, there's no ability to cheat the system. Now it goes on, and I can explain that in another, in another session sometime. Simple case for us at home or in our small business, e-transfer, the doctrine of an e-transfer, which is something that has come popular in the last five to 10 years. You can email money to somebody. You can send, you could send me money, I could send you money by simply emailing you from my bank account and that money that email arrives at your computer and you can then click on it and deposit money into your account so we have these different ways to pay for things they are all money but they're not necessarily currency like you would consider a dollar bill or a coin to be currency item number seven the concept of debasement of the currency you might remember this from your history medieval times even biblical times, sometimes evil leaders like kings or emperors, governments would debase the currency so they would clip the coins. And so let's say you had a, a, a ducat or a, a gold coin or a denarii. Sometimes the emperor would take that coin, which was made up of a certain weight of metal, and it was guaranteed to be so. And that's why people believe that it was worth money. It was worth what it says it was worth. But coins would be debased or clipped. And so sometimes they literally, a king would have an official way of cutting off a piece of the coin. And therefore that's an inflationary concept, right? Because less money is available for you to, to use, but the price remains the same. So it's a form of inflation. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Sometimes they would add alloys. So inside of a gold coin instead of you know 99.9 percent .9 pure gold 24 karat gold 15 karat gold 18 karat gold whatever they would add alloys tin or lead would be sneaked into the coin and therefore the coin would would cost less to produce but it would be trading for the same value so let's say you had a one dollar coin and you clipped it or debased it it could be maybe only 50 cents worth of material 
but it would be worth a dollar. So you had a form of clipping coins, which was always used to kind of cheat the system. Much more could be said about that. Number eight, digital currency. Right now, everybody's heard of some of these digital currencies that are out there. And it's probably right now, the last time I looked, there are about at least 30 or 40 different types of the digital currency. And the trick with these is that they are generally accepted as currency now, which is very interesting, but they're not regulated in the same way. And so how can we have a system where everybody accepts digital currency, like Bitcoin, for example, or Deuterium or some of these other ones, but they're not regulated by governments? Well, the mechanism that's used is a clever method called the blockchain. And if you don't know anything about that, you should research it because increasingly transactions, commercial transaction contracts and others are going to be controlled by blockchain, which is a method of using a certain kind of software to guarantee that no changes, no cheating can occur in the, in the, in the steps of a transaction. So it's a whole long story, but the digital currency right now is made up of various different acceptable methods and people do accept payment not universally governments hate this model of course because they can't regulate it and they can't control it using monetary policy it's a bit of a wild west thing you've heard of stories somebody lost their secret password to their digital currency and of course there's millions of dollars locked up there and then nobody can ever get it because you can't scam the system you can't hack a blockchain system number nine today is the concept of a cashless society. Now this is an old expression that started in the 60s and the 70s, but you'd be aware that we are definitely heading towards a cashless society. What's happening now is because governments are trying to get into the government digital currency business where they do control it and they can monitor your behavior and your spending because every transaction then is recorded using the blockchain and so you can't hide in transactions. So imagine a society where we have no cash, but we use different digital currencies, like your debit card is a form of digital currency. And so there's a lot of concern about this move by governments because they cannot control the blockchain digital currencies. They're going to invent their own. And so that's not a conspiracy. That's true. And so that's coming. Item number 10, the exchange rates. Why is, for example, when you travel to another country, let's say you're in the U.S. and you travel to Canada or Mexico, and you'll notice that the U.S. dollar is worth way more in those other countries. So if you come from Canada to the U.S., for example, it's something like 28 or 30 percent. And so if I have one dollar U.S. and I take it back to Canada and I deposit it into my bank account, I get a dollar 30 Canadian. Or if I want to send $500 to somebody in the U.S., I might have to spend, you know, 700 or 720 dollars Canadian to buy 500 dollars US. How does that come about? What's that exchange rate thing? Well, that's a complicated story. It's not going to be told today, but just remember that the exchange rate is based on the volume of exports and imports between countries, the relative strength of your country's economy, and whether you have an export surplus actually strengthens your dollar. That's why the US has got this petrodollar strength in the world because it controls so much of the world's wealth and resources that we have a trade surplus in the US compared to other countries and this is why we have this exchange rate thing that strengthens some currencies and weakens other currencies that's why you have people who can play that and they can do the the arbitrage they call it where you can buy and sell currencies. We even do this in our own lives. If you're a Canadian citizen, you will always invariably have a U.S. bank account and you buy U.S. dollars when the Canadian dollar is high. When the Canadian dollar is low, you don't want to buy U.S. dollars because it'll cost you more. So you keep accumulating in your U.S. bank account the U.S. dollar and then when you travel into the United States, well, you've got yourself dollars that you bought at a lower rate. So you've practiced hedging and you have done some a very smart business practice just in your own little personal way in your family at home. Item 11 today, the money supply. You've heard economists talking about <clears throat> what the money supply is. And the money supply is the sum total of all the cash and all the bank accounts and the lines of credit and the loans and the short-term deposits and all those things we just talked about. 
That's called the money supply. There used to be some definitions that were rather complex. M1, M for money. M1 is the total of all cash. That's the currency and the coins that are in circulation in the entire economy. M2 is the um, bank accounts, the credits, the lines of credit, the loans, the short-term deposits, the certificates of deposit, all these things that are not actually currency, but they are money. Those things are, are part of the money supply. And you have an interesting concept in economics, which we can talk about later, called the velocity of money, how money turns over. Here's a quick example. You get paid on Friday, and you're going to go to the grocery store, and you're going to buy groceries, and you're going to fill your car with gas, and you're going to go for a movie. You're going to spend your money. And so when you get paid, let's say just for the sake of round numbers, you get paid $1,000, and you spend $100 on groceries, well, that grocer is then going to buy... Let's say you go to the corner grocery store, not the big box store. That grocer is going to use that money that you spent to pay for his goods and services and to buy his groceries and to pay for his children's education. So you have this thing called velocity of money, which is a complex mathematical subject favored by economists. But the concept is that it's real. Money does turn over. There's the multiplier effect of spending. It's called the multiplier effect. We can talk more about that later. Uh, item number 12 today the petrodollar, the world reserve currency. The point I wanted to make in addition to what has been said so far is that the petrodollar is strengthened, I was going to say artificially, that's not, that's doesn't connote the right thing, but it's strengthened by an imperceptible strength. The US, the most powerful nation on earth, the most economically strong nation on earth, that earns the petrodollar or the US dollar F a premium, you might say. So it's not artificial in that sense, it's real. But remember that that's an intangible. So anything I've said about exports or imports or exchange rates, it's also typified by the power of your nation. If you can force countries to use your currency as the medium of exchange, you know, in some African nation, Niger is in the news these days. So you listen to Niger, which we used to call Niger when I was a kid, but it's Niger. Niger has some kind of a currency, but nobody cares, right? Because there's only 7 million people in Niger or, or something, and those people can use that whatever currency they have to make local transactions. But if they want to buy automobiles or they want to buy imports, from a US company or a Canadian company, they're going to have to pay in US dollars and they're, therefore the, the local currency doesn't matter. So the world reserve currency is not only real, but its strength is added to it because of the power of the nation. And that's why money and money and banking is such a, a vital global topic. And then the final comment today, point number 13, foreign exchange, the concept of hedging and your US dollars and your uh, Canadian dollars and the exchange rate between them. If you're a business, it's very important that you do consider the concept of hedging your expenses. So if you buy fuel, let's say you're a trucking company based in the United States, you might want to buy uh, currency futures on a currency futures market. Now it's a complicated subject, but you might want to buy a forward contract that says, you're going to pay for fuel now at a fixed price and you're going to mark that in so that when the time comes for you to take delivery of the fuel three months from now six months from now you're only going to pay that lower price for it and it doesn't matter what happens to the price then you're you're locked in you're fixed at good lower price that's called hedging or forward averaging or forward hedging this is a legitimate and good way to do business and you should be thinking about that particularly if you're an exporter or if you are buying uh, inputs that are fluctuating in price like gas, like oil, like electricity, like a number of other factors. You've heard of uh, futures contracts where you buy and sell on the basis of future delivery. So there's a famous story about the guy who bought a futures contract in pork bellies. He bought a futures contract but he forgot to sell it and so he took delivery one day a truck arrived and dumped pork bellies on his front yard now that's a bit of a myth but you can see the concept of hedging it's an important concept I'll close on that today with you that you need to think about hedging your dollars even if it's just to make sure that you have currency if you're a Canadian company and you're selling into the US it's better that you have purchased your US dollars at a low price and you have them in your bank account 
There are FX companies, they call it foreign exchange FX. There are a lot of companies that will help you to do hedging like this. It's a very legitimate and good form of business planning and it can save you a lot of money if you bet right and if you hedge your currency, you hedge your future costs so that you know now what you're going to pay for that expense when the time actually comes. So there you go. Lots of talk about currency today, the difference between currency and money, and all sorts of interesting topics. You can see why, personally, I'm interested in this topic very much, money and banking. But it's also vital to the business owner to know more about this and to be sensitive to what's going on so that you can spot trends and you can understand the signals that people are telling you when the politicians and the economists and the consulting firms and the, the business people are talking about various matters of currency, you know what they're talking about then and you have some ideas of how you can use that knowledge to protect, you protect your business but also to, to control certain features of your business like costs and, and some of your revenues as well. So there you go. That's the Catholic Business Wisdom Series for today. God bless you and your business and we'll see you next time. It's the Catholic CEO, Henry Katarna. Thanks for joining us today.